Hello, everybody. Happy Wine of Wednesday. Super excited to um, share some really amazing wines with you tonight. Um, hopefully, everyone has um, their wines already ready to go and some glassware and your tasting sheets. Um, if you're just tuning in and you don't have the wines, um, that's awesome. We're going to do a lot of talking about kind of Rio Hall, what makes it special unique, what makes it unique to the rest of the world, and what makes it unique within Spain, too, and uh, how to more easily shop for Rioja. So don't worry if um, if you don't have the wines, you're still going to learn a lot and um, open whatever you do have, and uh, we'd love to know what you are drinking tonight, too. So if you're tuned in and you are uh, logged into the chat room, love to um, just hear not hear who you are, but uh, see who you are and where, where you're coming from. So just go ahead and um, put in the chat room your name and where you're coming from. And um, so I know who is out there. Um, meanwhile, while everyone is uh, logging on, want to make sure that we do, we're going to start off with this. We're only doing one wine at a time this class. A lot of times we do side by side. Side by sides are not going to help us enjoy or understand the wines better this class. So just one wine at a time. We're going to start off with the Ostatu Blanco. Um, so go ahead and make sure that you have that out of the refrigerator. And the second wine that um, hopefully was already chilled down, if you got my um, tasting notes, and, I mean my setup notes in time, this wine, go ahead and pull that out of the refrigerator too. We're going to tune it. We're going to use that, um, um, but I want it to warm up a little bit um, while we taste through the white wine. So this uh, blueberry or, or leggy, um, we're going to taste second. If uh, you have the other two reds and you're opening up all of them, go ahead and open up um, both of the next red wines. This one, though, needs air. It's going to be really hard and difficult to appreciate this wine unless it has a little chance to open up. Um, it doesn't matter if you just pour it into a wine glass, and then um, if you have it in the wine glass right here, you can just you know go back and forth a bunch of times. You can put it in a flower vase, a coffee pot, a water pitcher, literally anything. You don't have to have a fancy decanter. This wine does need some serious air. Just make sure whatever vessel you're using um, is clean, doesn't smell like coffee or um, potting soil or whatever else was in the vessel before you put wine into it. Um, even a decanter, sometimes they'll get dusty um, or just have extra wine residual um, gunk in the bottom. So you rinse it out with either wine or something like that. I like to rinse uh, my um, glassware uh, out with wine. So it neutralizes the pH and keeps everything Tasting like wine. Um, awesome, Tawana, happy, happy birthday. So today is Tawana's birthday. She tunes into all of the classes. We're so happy that you are still celebrating um, with us uh, for your birthday. Um, that makes my heart so happy. Um, I'm sorry that I put on your wine package happy anniversary in my head. It was the anniversary, not the birthday. But um, either way, my mom, um, my mom said it's the anniversary of your birthday. So there we go. So, um, and uh, Jake and Cora from Norfolk, great to see y'all. Super excited for these wines. I think you're going to really, really enjoy them. I know um, a little bit your taste buds. And um, so hopefully these wines are going to be awesome. Anna and Beth from Norfolk um, with Hector and Berna, Berna, sorry, Bernaline or Bernadine. Um, and great, I, I think, I, I don't know if I've met y'all yet, so that's awesome. I know Amy and Beth, of course, but Ryan, great to see you again. Um, decanting since four, yes, that's wonderful. So glad um, one's gonna be singing for you. Um, and if you don't finish this wine tonight, don't worry, put a cork in it, come back to it the next day. Um, tomorrow night, it's gonna be gorgeous. Um, this is like the third time I've had this wine. I keep trying to feature it, I keep drinking it before I feature it or anything because it's so good. So um, I finally was able to um, uh, get enough so that I had backup uh, for this. So um, uh, Marion, enjoying their wine? Awesome. Are you starting off with that Ostati Rosé because that wine is gorgeous? Um, yes, happy birthday indeed. Um, and... Berna Lynn. Okay, cool. Awesome. So that is a really beautiful name, Berna Lynn. Um, that's gorgeous. Uh, thank you for uh, phonetically making that out for me. So, um, and some mom and some pop, of course, coming from Suffolk. Here. A excited crowd for Rioja. Um, 
let me just introduce kind of how, what my first interactions with um, Rioja were. And um, since they were so young in my wine journey, they really helped shape my love of wine. And while I'm just kind of giving the introduction, go ahead and pour yourself a big old glass of that Rioja Blanco. And this is not gonna be a very analytical class like the blind tastings. So you can go ahead and just swirl, smell, sip, savor, enjoy those tasting note pages. Um, these ones right here are here for however much or as little as you want to use them. So if you want to fill out detailed tasting notes of every single wine that we're trying, awesome, do that. We um, also have for you this wine aroma chart um, to kind of help give you a vocabulary word bank for anything that you're um, trying to name and smell. That is really helpful. And this kind of gives you a step-by-step -step guide for the tastings. <laughs> Those of you who have been tuning in for a lot of the classes, you know these documents by heart. Um, if you're brand new, um, don't worry too much about them. If you tune into one of the blind tasting classes, we will use them a lot, and you'll get very familiar with them. But in the meantime, cheers, everybody. If you are with some people, cheers. And um, I'm going to give you an air cheers and um, start <coughs> sipping away. Um, I'm going to give kind of the introduction of Rioja while we sip the white wines, and we're going to get really into the wines um, with the red wines especially. So my first kind of more intellectual experiences with wine, meaning not just like drinking with friends and delicious stuff to drink, but more like, oh, serious analyzing wine, getting into the tasting notes. Um, um, what started in Bordeaux, France, um, and then quickly went into Rioja, Spain, because um, Bordeaux is very expensive. And Rioja offers a lot of similar qualities to Bordeaux and similar winemaking techniques um, without the price tag of Bordeaux. So it was um, a cheaper way for me to get the red wine experience that I was looking for and hoping for in terms of European red wines um, without the price tag um, and the commitment um, that comes along with spending more money on um on wine. Um, and my first producer that I really fell in love with was Muga. They're in Rioja Alta, um, one of the subregions of Rioja. And it was, it was just such an incredible experience to have all of that fruit with all of like the oak and the power that comes along with the serious oak aging that they do there, which is similar to Bordeaux. Um, and I just really, really fell in love with the complexity and intrigue, and I liked the unique style that uh, Rioja was made in, which we'll talk about um, uh, more in a little bit. So since then, like my love for Spanish wine has not um, has not uh, sub uh, gone down at all. It's just increased, and I've realized how much more Spain has to offer than just Rioja. But my first love for Spanish wine will always be Rioja. And so I'm really excited to share these with you tonight. If you're tuning in from Williamsburg, you have had so many Rioja wines from me before just because um, at La Tienda, that's all we did was Spanish wine classes. Um, but some of these wines will be new to you. So um, hopefully you will enjoy them. Um, if everyone could make sure um, they have this sheet, if you have it out there. So the map of Rioja and then the, re oh, uh, the requirements for aging um, right on the bottom. So that's what we'll go over. On the reverse side, you have um, some other information about Spanish wine. I may reference that in the future, but um, we're gonna focus on the front page with the map of Rioja. So if you can tell, this is the full map of Spain. So the map of the Rioja, little red dot right in here, you can see is very far north um, up into Spain, close to the mountains um, that separate Spain and France. We're only about two and a half hours drive to Bordeaux. So very, very close to the Bordeaux region of France and heavily influ influenced throughout history um, by Bordeaux, by Bordeaux winemakers and how they made their wine. So this then is a zoom in of Rioja. So Rioja has broken down into three regions. You have Rioja Baja, Rioja Baja is a warmer climate, it's more Mediterranean, it's lower elevation, a little bit more clay in the soil. So they focus a lot on uh, garnacha based um, red wines, rosé, uh, white wines um, also, but more bulk wines uh, meant for local consumption, house wine, like restaurant house wine. Um, we don't see a lot of wines coming from Rioja Baja in the United States. More kept for like quantity style wine um, and for local com consumption. 
The bulk of our quality Rioja wines are gonna come from red and white, a little bit of rosé, but 90% of Rioja is red wines. We're gonna come from Rioja Alta, um, that's the larger yellow area, and Rioja Alavesa, which kind of encompasses this broader region of Alava, which is more in the Basque country of Spain, further north. Um, so Rioja Al uh, Alavesa is the smallest region of all three, and it's the furthest north, um, and that's actually where all of our wines come from today. I figured it'd be better to focus on kind of um, one region rather than trying to get four wines that encompass every single style that, um, that Rioja has to offer. So um, Rioja Alta is the coolest of the regions. Um, it has north-facing vineyards, so they're going to get less sun exposure throughout the entire year. I mean, uh, throughout the growing season, I should say. Versus Rioja Alave, speaking, those, those vineyards are higher up um, in terms of away from sea level. And they are thus have a, a bigger shift between night and day temperatures. You actually have more sunlight. So the wines are a little bit more powerful, a little bit more robust, a little bit more fruit forward, a little bit more muscular. Um, and uh, Rioja Alta is much cooler, um, even though it's lower elevation and much rainier too. So you have the Sierra Cantabria mountain range um, that is to the north of, uh, of Rioja. And that kind of shields a lot of the intense, cool, wet, very intense winds coming down um, from the north of Spain, that Atlantic Ocean influence. And right on the border here, Rioja Baja meets Rioja Alta and Rioja La Vesa. You have a lot more, um, um, you have like almost a strict Lime. Here soils, calcareous clay um, as well, so a lot of limestone mixed with clay and alluvial soils, higher elevation, more Atlantic influence, and then as soon as you hit that line that Rioja Baja starts, you just have this warmer climate, way more clay in your soil, and, and those and those higher elevation kind of slopes down to almost um, plateau-like. Um, so very different style. We're going to hang out in Rioja Alavesa, and i um, very, very excited to try these wines um, from you. Um, or with you, not from you, sorry. Um, Marion, you know, I'm not sure about that. So by train or by car, um, I have never actually been to Spain, sadly enough. I've been to France, uh, but not to Spain. Um, I was I was reading some interviews with some winemakers, and they were talking about two and a half hour by car, but maybe they mean tar car of a train, because that would make more sense in terms of the distance. I thought, I was like, I don't understand how you can get that far. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm repeating information, but now I realize that that seems, yes, like a short, a long distance to travel in two and a half hours, four and a half hour by car. Okay. So maybe two and a half hour by train. So, all right. So, um, let's talk about history real quick. And then I want to talk about all of the region reasons why Rioja is so unique as a region, not just within the whole world, but within Spain itself, Rioja stands alone as a very, very different and unique region for how they make wine, their history, and what wine tastes like today. So basically winemaking started with the Phoenicians. We're talking 600 to 300 BCE. So like very, very long ago, the Phoenicians set up camp there and all up and down France and um, cultivated vines, and they were big wine drinkers. So that's kind of when it started, but we're talking about clay pots, massive, we're not talking about sophisticated wines. Fast forward to 780, um, and then you have the Moors that come throughout Spain. And so all wine production like, virtually stopped, very, very little wine production, basically until the 1300s, the medieval era, when um, you have the, um, um, the, um, the monastic traditions that come in with the Catholic church um, in their in their institutions. So a lot of monasteries built all throughout Spain, and some of these monasteries actually became wineries later on um, in history. So very much brought back wine culture to uh, Spain, but it didn't really become quality wine culture until in the mid 1800s, all the way up through the 1900s. So whereas France started their quality wine production kind of starting in the 14 to 15 to 1600s, much earlier, Spain didn't really get on that board up until the 1800s. So we kind of have a few hundred years lag between. We talk about how Washington state wines are a little bit lagged behind California state wines because the 20 year difference and when they started making more quality wines. Now we're talking a little more like 200 years um, in Spain versus French wine history. So that is why the price is so different. Um, and, um, and just overall, the development of the wines is, is very different. So 
The locks were hits in the 1850s. So we've all heard me talk about this for quite a bit. This is the little louse that is native to the vine root or the um, native to the east coast of the U.S. that feeds off of vine roots. Doesn't feed off of the vine roots that are native to the U.S. Think Muscadine, Scepperdong, Concord, Norton. Um, but it really, really, really loves the vine roots that are native to Europe. Think Tempranillo, Cabernet, Chardonnay, um, Pinot Noir. So as they accidentally bring this little bug, this little tiny minuscule louse um, to Europe, um, it starts wiping off the vineyards like very, very quickly. 90, over 99% of all of European vines were killed off in a matter of 70 years. So from about 1850 through about 1920, that 70 year period kills off 99% of European vines, massive destruction. So as Bordeaux is hit really, really significantly starting just in 1850, very quickly, they realize they can't, they, all their vines are dead. They can't make wine anymore, but they still have a market for it. So they were getting wine um, by the bulk, like by the gallon, by the juice, not just grapes, shipped in from, not shipped in, trained in, carted in, shipped in, um, all of the above, um, probably not trains then. Hmm, I don't know. Don't quote me on that. They're bringing it in, however they're bringing it in. Um, and um, they're making Bordeaux wines from Spanish juice, from Rioja. Then after a while, that becomes unsustainable. So a lot of these Bordeaux winemakers actually just move to Rioja, Spain and set up their own wineries there and start adapting, um, you know, using instead of French oak and, and, and making Spanish wine. They're just Bordeaux, Bordeaux winemakers making Rioja in this area. So... Very different development, so there was a lot of uh, cross-influence um, and connection between France and Spain at the time. Um, and But then all of that is halted with World War I, then World War II, and then the Franco dictatorship. Basically, we didn't have good wine production in Spain that started up again until mid-1970s through the 1980s. So when Spain joins the EU, EU in uh, 1986, Six, I think um, they finally um, kind of adopted the EU standards of practice and classification system um, and and really developed their wine culture a lot since then. So they had a hard, hard, hard um, another few decades. So now we're back on track and um, the quality of um, Spanish wine and specifically wines from Rio has just increased dramatically over the last uh, few years. But the prices haven't increased quite as dramatically, especially not like France. So Spain is still, to this day, one of the best value buys um, for red, white, rosé, sparkling, anything you can think of. So let's, um, I'm going to chat real quickly about um, this wine. And since y'all are probably all tired of history, and then we'll talk about why Rioja is so unique and how they make wine and what it tastes like. So this is by Bodegas Ostatu. Um, they are in Rioja La Vesa, just like all of our wines tonight. And this is a blend of Viura, the most prominent gr white grape in Rioja, otherwise known as Macabeo throughout the rest of Spain. Um, so that's one of the key grapes of making sparkling wine or cava. Um, is Macabeo. Same grape, just called different thing. They're very regionalistic in Spain, so um, they have lots of different names for grapes um, all throughout Spain. So, and then the other grape is Malvasia or Malvasia. Um, and um, this is not oak. It is made in a very fresh style. White wines from Rioja can be anywhere from this super crisp, clean, light, acidic, bright, fresh, good summer wines to really oak aged, intense white wines that if you like oaky, buttery Chardonnays from California, like this would be a good alternative. Um, wines that could age for um, decades even. Um, so all spectrums, I definitely wanted to pick the more like summer end of the spectrum. And this is one of the wines that I've been featuring in my six packs for a while now. So are y'all smelling anything in this wine? And what did you experience uh, in the taste of the wine? Was it... Um, how did how did how did you like this wine? We won't we won't get too analytical about it, but tell me your thoughts. Um, great question. Read that Malvasia is an ancient grape. Where did it when did it migrate to Spain? So 
Malvasia or Malvasia, um, I believe is actually native to Croatia. And so we're talking about a European cross migration over centuries. So I'm not sure exactly when the first sightings were in Spain, but I believe it really dates back to the 1300s. So been in Spain for a long time and there's so many different types of clones throughout it. So this is specifically called Malvasia Riojano. Um, so lots of different, like very, very small minuscule difference between clonal variations of Malvasia or Malvasia um, as it traveled. I am, I am close. I am close to being sure that it is native to Croatia, but um, actually Ryan, Awesome, great. I was gonna say, hold on, we have a Croatian wine expert in the group, so awesome. Um, but I'm glad I didn't mess that up with you being here. Um, um, you won't get into that, but yes, okay. Croatian, awesome. Glad, um, glad I didn't miss, uh, miss up that information, so. A lot of floral, yes, there's loads of floral notes in there. Not like dense, perfumed, like sickeningly sweet floral notes, but really delicate and bright kind of dancing flowers, so. But apple, awesome, green and yellow. Yes, yes, yes. Um, just ripe enough to eat off the tree. Cool. Hints of honeysuckle with some herb notes. Yeah, I love the herbal quality too. Um, as much as there is fruit in here, I'm getting a lot more of like the floral, 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 floral and herbal put together as floral um, um, qualities in this wine um, in that minerality too. So Thought it was pretty full body for a white. It could stand up to food and cheese, green apple with tropical fruits on the nose, some minerality too. Yes, yes, loads and loads of minerality. And to me, whenever I get wines, even if they're unoaked, uh, and even if they aren't aged on the lees or the yeast, it gives that creamier texture. Or if they don't go through malolactic, which gives it that buttery texture. Even without all that, wines that have a lot of minerality to them, even crisp white wines give a more full body texture on your mouth because um, kind of coats the whole mouth because of that minerality. So they can be kind of deceiving, a lighter bodied wine with a full tongued textural component. So um, I know you said seafood, but it did go well with our pork tenderloin. Yeah, um, fully, fully uh, support that decision to pair this wine with pork tenderloin. Um, I think that there is a little bit of like this flinty minerality, almost like um, gunmetal uh, or like um, flintier, um, um, smokier kind of minerality to it too. So it has a hint of this like more fruit. There's a lot going on for being a still, still a little bit more delicate wine. So um, awesome. Malvasia is one of your favorite grapes. Love it. Several Croatian producers. Yeah. Um, the, the Malvasia that I've had from Croatia, totally different, like instead of the green apple and like um, underripe tropical notes and stuff like this, like we have here, it's like ripe fruit and loads of um, melon and um, more like mango and papaya, a little bit more like on the riper, denser style of tropical and loads and loads and loads of floral notes. So um, love Croatian Malvasia or Malvasia, however you want to say it. Um, all right. So... Um, Whenever you're ready, we're gonna pour the next red wine. Um, anyone like really thumbs up? Like, was this anyone, um, um, you know, surprised how much they like it before we go on to that one? Like that one. I get like a lot of um, tarragon. To me, I, I, yeah, I think I'm getting like tarragon, like not sweet herbs like sage, but just on the sweeter side. Um, but there is some bitter components to it too. So, um, and loads of citrus. I mean, a lot of like lemon peel um, and like grapefruit pith kind of thing going on. So, um, great that you've never tried. Awesome, awesome. Anna, I figured you guys would like it considering how much you love Sancerre. Very, very similar in, in, in kind of textural style with that minerality, that tropical note. Um, and, and just the vibrancy of it. So, um, awesome. Great. Glad y'all enjoyed it. Not quite as much as the Chenin Blancs though. Yes. Yes. My dad really, really loved those Chenin Blancs that we did in last week's class. So whenever you're ready, we're going to go ahead and pour the next one. And so this is the chilled red. Um, so the Luberry is the name of the producer or Leji is the name of the, just this particular leaf that they make. So hopefully y'all have it chilled down. It is not necessary that this wine is served chilled. It's not even like specifically recommended. I just really enjoy this wine chilled. So I wanted you to try it and you can go back and try it after all the reds and let it come to room temperature to see which you prefer better. Um, but I'm gonna do a little bit of rinse in my glass. 
Um, for this one, just so those floral notes don't get confusing with the red wine. Um, so put yourself some of this, go ahead and get into the tasting, smelling, y'all know the drill. Um, and I wanna talk about why Rioja is so unique and um, so interesting. So first of all, all of Europe used French oak or Hungarian oak or Slovenian oak for pretty much all of their winemaking if they're using oak for most of European wine history. 90% um, of it French oak, especially the quality wines. Um, American oak was kind of unheard of in terms of its use, but during the 16th and 17th centuries, um, I'm sorry, 17th and 18th centuries, you have a lot more American oak being used all throughout Spain because they were traveling back and forth to the Americas. France and Spain weren't getting along so well, trade issues, we don't know anything about that. Um, and so there was cheaper for them actually to bring American oak back across the Atlantic Ocean than it was for them to get French oak from France. Really interesting how that all worked out. Um, so unique to all of Europe, no other, no other country used um, American oak quite as much and Rioja really embraced it. So the rest of Spain did less um, oak aging in general. Rioja is kind of known for its um, oak aging. Um, Tempranillo loves, 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 loves oak. It just does really well with oak. It's like Corona and lime. It's kind of hard to imagine it without it. Although this expression that y'all are tasting right now is an oakless Tempranillo. So you get to see kind of what the grape has to offer just kind of by itself. So that's one of the reasons that Rioja is unique. It's use of American oak. The other region, reason why it's unique is most other regions throughout, not just Spain, but throughout the, um, the all of European countries have very specific requirements based on each region about what grapes are allowed to be grown and in what kind of specific percentages they're allowed to be blended if they are allowed to be blended. In Rioja, there's no specific requirement for um, any specific um, percentage. They just they just stipulate that Tempranillo needs to be the majority base of the blend, but you can kind of blend it with anything else after that. And if you're making a white wine, um, any other grapes that are international grapes, thinking Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, anything that's brought there from somewhere else that wasn't kind of locally uh, and traditionally used, can't be the majority um, of the blend. That's it. So there's no other specific requirements. So it gives this broad spectrum of possibilities of flavor profiles when you have that many kind of rules to bend or no rules actually. So you don't have as many parameters. Um, the second reason why historically it's so different is its tradition of negociant style winemaking. So you think of a winery and you think of me, I'm the winemaker and I own the winery and I own the vineyards and then I hire people to work the vineyards and we all make wine together and then I produce a bottle called Vino Culture Wine. Um, that, is, that, is, that is what we generally think of when we think of winemaking. Versus in Rioja, historically, basically, um, you have what's called just negociant style. So you own any vineyards, if I just kind of like, around the, um, the winery for show almost as part of the estate. But I'm actually just going to buy grapes from all the local growers or farmers. So I might buy grapes from 20 different farmers or what we call growers in the wine world. And, um, and then they're gonna ship me either grapes or juice and I'm gonna make wine from that. So I, I, I make very little wine from my own grapes. It's really just using the local farmers. Each vintage could be different, which farmers I'm working with. Um, so you you generally don't see um, this radical um, uh, focus on terroir like you do in French wine, where every vineyard is site specific, where everything is just like, this is so unique, this wine from this little plot, because they're making big amounts of wine from growers that are all the entire region. In fact, there were only up until basically, you know, in the last 50 years, there were only a handful of huge wine wineries. Think Marquez de Caceres, Marquez de Murrieta, La Rioja Alta. You've all seen these Muga. You've all seen these names in the grocery stores. And any time you basically see a Rioja producer and you can see it in a grocery store, that's a negociant style winery. So they're buying grapes in bulk from lots and lots of other people. 
So they've basically created all like the collective handful of these uh, wineries created this um, consistent style of Rioja. So instead of focusing on terroir specificity, I can only say that at the very beginning of the class, um, they focus on style specificity. So Rioja developed over the years a very unique style that was kind of un, um, unseen so far. So they do extensive oak aging. We talked about that, lots of American oak. But while they're aging their Tempranillo in American oak, they actually allow and encourage oxidation of the wine during that winemaking practice and aging practice. So you often get these Rioja wines that are very nutty, they're caramelly, they're almost like that um, brown color instead of ruby or purple. And that's because oxygen changes the shape, the texture, the color of wine um, as it oxidizes. Oxi oxygen chemically just alters the way that the wine, um, the wine tastes, the, wine, the way the wine smells, and how it ferments and sits. So they developed this oxidative style and um, which worked for Tempranillo. Like it really did. Tempranillo worked with that. It worked with the oak. It has higher acid, so it was able to withstand the extra oxygen. Um, so it really just did really well. And it was this unique style that um, no one else was really doing. So you could, I could still to this day pick up a bottle of that style of Rioja and just be like, yep, that's Rioja. Just one smell is all it takes. It's so unique in its style. We're not actually featuring any of these wines today because you know me, I always want to take us out of the comfort zone that we might be used to. Um, so that's the other one of the other reasons why it's so unique is that oxygen. Um, and then lastly, which I think is one of the coolest things that makes Rioja so unique is that they take care of the aging at the winery. So Bordeaux, when it's released after you know five years in the bottle or barrel or combination of the two, when it's released, it's not ready to drink generally for several years, sometimes 10, 15, 20 years before that wine is ready to drink. And they, the, the wineries and the, and the chateaus, leave it up to you, the consumer, to take care of that. Retailers aren't going to age it for you. I don't have enough space in my tiny little wine room to age 30 cases of wine so that I can finally release it to you, the consumer, when it's ready to drink. Um, so it's up to you, the consumer. So oftentimes, Bordeaux is unappreciated because people are drinking it too young and they don't have the time, the patience, or the wherewithal to age the wine as much as it needs to be. Well, Rioja operates a little bit differently. The wineries themselves will age the wine, not just and not in a barrel the whole time, although there are some weird instances of that happening, like a barrel-aged wine that's been in barrel for 40 plus years. That's insane. Um, but they have the tradition of after it's put into the bottle and, and aged for the certain amount of time, then they'll age it for five more years, 10 more years, who knows, until they're like, oh yeah, she ready now. And then they'll release it. So you can find in the market, 1999, 1998, 2000, 2001, Rio has right now, today, if you go to the right, the right store, and those are current release Riojas. Now that doesn't mean it's the first time they've released it. Say I'm a winery, I'm like, oh, this 1999 vintage is really delicious right now. It's, it's currently 2005 or 2006. So I'm gonna release, you know, a thousand or 200 cases to the market. And then five more years pass by, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna release it. I'm do gonna do a second release of this wine. They continue to release it, holding back a little bit of wine called library wine, where they hold back lots of different vintages kind of collected throughout. Um, but that way you don't pay for anyone else to age it and you don't have to age it. You know it's been aged well because it's at the winery. And so you can get these amazing 20 year old Riojas that are still just like 65 bucks, which is the expensive wine for every day. Um, but it's really not bad at all when you're thinking about how long that wine has been hanging out, waiting for you to drink it. So really interesting how they do that. Take a look at that. The last wine we have is a 2012 vintage, and that is this current release. Um, so that's, that's just other examples. So look for those and don't shy away from ordering really old Rioja. It hasn't been sitting on the wine shelf for that long. It has been aged properly, I promise. So, um, all right, this wine that we're drinking is 97% Tempranillo. 3% um, of it is Viura, a white grape, uh, same grape from Ember Maccabeo. 
that is added to it adds a little bit more lift, a little bit more acid, a little bit more pop um, and, and freshness to, um, to the wine, but only 3%, so I didn't even list it on there. It's made in what's called carbonic maceration style, and that's where instead of grapes come in, I crush them with my feet, and then creates this juice, and the juice turns into wine. It's fermented over the course of, you know, two weeks maybe, and then aged in barrel, and then put in the bottle. Carbonic maceration is different. That's where all of the whole clusters of grapes pile it on, pile it on, pile it on, and the bottom grapes start to get crushed from the pressure of the top heavy grapes um, coming down on it. Well, as they start to crush, they'll start to naturally ferment because um, there's, there's ambient yeast in the air and that will eat the sugar of the grapes and start the fermentation process. Well, fermentation, the yeast eats the sugar, the byproduct is alcohol and carbon dioxide. Well, this tank is sealed, so the pressure is continuing to build as these bottom grapes start to ferment. Now, as the pressure builds, it will spontaneously create other um, grape clusters to start bursting and fermenting. So you have this natural spontaneous fermentation, but instead of crushing and macerating the juice with the skins of the grape, which will give it that tannins, that, that robustness, that grip, that masculine texture, you don't have any of that. So you get all the fruit flavors without the intensity of tannins. And they usually just press the juice off right away. And um, so you have a really fresh fruit forward, not oaky. This is not oaked at all. It just goes straight into, um, into bottle and released right away. And so it's a really fun wine to have with a slight chill on it. It's really difficult to have. Oh, we're opening up herbs over there and I can smell them. Uh, I guess we're doing a little experiment over here. Uh, my, uh, my parents are in the herb cabinet bringing all these spices out and uh, seeing what, what, what I can smell. Them. Oh, man, what is that? Cinnamon and cardamom? Nice. <laughs> um, so um, anyways, it's really hard to serve an oak red wine with a chill on it because it chills down all the other flavors except for the oak. So it's just like chewing on a piece of bark. But if you can find a red wine that doesn't have any oak aging on it, you can serve it with a slight chill on it. Really good with spicy food or food off the grill, something that you want a red wine with, but you're outside and it's 100 degrees. Um, so all that being said, lots of talking there. I promise I'm not going to talk this much throughout the rest of the class. Um, what did you think of this wine? Was it surprising? Have you ever had a Tempranillo like this that wasn't super oaky? Um, makes me think of popcorn. I like that. Um, and it, um, that, um, kind of almost just creamy buttery, uh, flavor. So, um, um, oh, y'all are all talking about the spices in the, in the comment room. <laughs> okay. In the chat room. Um, let's see here. First red smells good. Buttery fruit. Yeah. It's super buttery and creamy. Um, the color of this wine instantly stands out, doesn't it? It's like this deep fuchsia magenta purpley color. Um, definitely no oxidation in this at all. So oxidation will turn a wine a little bit more brown or tawny or golden hue. Um, really deeply berry colored. Like um, I, this is the color that I look for when I look for buying lipsticks. Um, so um, with some rum poured over it. Oh, I, okay. Sorry. I need to start at the top. Um, bread pudding with raisins and cinnamon it does have some spices to it. Now, typically, all those spices come from the oak that a wine is aged in. We know this wine isn't aged in oak, so that's just Tempranillo. That's what's so fun about Tempranillo is even without oak, it still has some of those spices, some of those uh, baking spices and black pepper, um, and that's just the, na the, the natural flavors of the grape. So sometimes you can get some chocolate in Tempranillo. Um, anyone get any, like... You get some like milk chocolate, maybe some bitter chocolate too, some dark chocolate. Ooh, it's like you just kind of break it off and kind of the smell when you just break apart chocolate bars, dark chocolate bars. Um, um, soaked raisins and rum with a touch of molasses. I like that molasses call too. Um, um, oh, there we go. Some says not cinnamon or nutmeg, but cardamom. So, um, so what was the conclusion? Did you? Um, after, mm -hmm. after getting the spices out, did you change your mind or are you uh, convinced it's part of it? I'm leaning more in that direction. Okay, so, all right. Some mom says she's leaning towards cardamom. Um, so, awesome. Um, we agree to disagree. Huh, isn't that the first time I've ever heard that? <laughs> they, 
They are so wonderful and have such a strong relationship, but I have never met two people who disagree more on wine. And um, it's pretty, it's pretty fantastic that, and that goes to show you, you don't have to have similar taste as your partner to both enjoy wine together. Um, um, strong marriage. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. All right. So could y'all envision this as it's warming up? What do you think? Would you prefer it with more of a chill on it? Do you prefer it um, warmer? Um, and could you envision it with, you know, Ooh, it's just so juicy. It's make my mouth water. Um, it's, um, I call wine like this um, flirty red wine because it's like fun and fresh and it's lighthearted. It's not serious and dense and like weigh me down. Um, and um, it's almost grapey. Um, you rarely get that in red wine especially, but I almost get like these Concord grapes, like this really juicy, juicy fruit. Preference is warmer, but this is good cold. All right, cool. Um, I just wanted to see that progression too as the wine shifts um, and changes in flavor. Um, I smell a lot more of this. Warms up. Grape juice. Um, so sounds very similar to fresh drawn. Yes, yes. Without as much of like, um, I guess the black pepper in this particular one as a Tehran would be. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Good call. Um, doesn't seem as dry as some reds do in the summer, right? Because it doesn't have that drying sensation of the tannins from oak or the tannins from the grape skins because of the way it was made with that carbonic maceration. Would prefer over a cab. Yeah, I think, um, especially in the summertime, cabs can just be a little much. Um, but yes, in the heat, and boy, do we ever get some heat here in Virginia. This is the perfect red wine, so. All right, the next two wines we're gonna think a little bit more about, um, especially the last one, and the last one is such an intense wine that I wanna give a lot of time, and I don't wanna like, have to rush through that last wine because um, um, it, it will it will be unfair to that wine. And uh, I've fallen in love with this wine, so I need to be fair to it. So we're going to go on to the next red, the Ostatu Crianza. We'll talk a little bit more about the oak aging requirements for um, Rioja and how they were developed and what all of how, what the labels mean and how to kind of discern the labels as we taste through this wine. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and pour that in your glass. And we'll get going. Give the wine some good swirls. Now we're getting into oak. So, um, whoo, man, I opened this wine up twice now, last night to just kind of get a feel for it because I actually hadn't had this one yet. With COVID, it's a lot harder to taste with my distributors as often as I used to. I used to do a tasting at least at least once a day throughout the week. Um, so sometimes up to 10 tastings a week. And now I'm not doing as many for sure. And so I just have to kind of rely on tasting notes and other people's recommendations when I'm buying wines for these classes because I, I don't get to taste as many wines in advance. So it's always kind of a, an exciting and nerve wracking thing when I planned a class around a wine and I first get it in, I was like, I hope it's good. But it smells drastically different than the bottle I opened up last night. Mm. <sighs> Hello, funk. Play that funky music. Man, yeah, there, there is some funk going on in this wine. So as y'all get your noses in there, um, noses, nose eye, I think maybe is that, is that plural word for that? Nose eye in there. Um, um, and, and, and figure out what, what oak is doing to the tempranillo that we just experienced before. Um, I wanna talk about this part, this, um, these words right here. So the Rioja aging requirements for red wine. So let me first say that um, when you see a bottle of California wine on it and it says reserve, it means absolutely nothing besides that they, that's their marketing strategy. So it legally means absolutely nothing. So many people put it on there because it's either older vines or maybe they aged it longer 
or they use their best grapes for that wine. It truly is their expression of a reserve wine. It's not their primary wine or primary label. It's not their flagship. It's, it's their reserve selection. But there are plenty of winemakers, not winemakers generally, but um, big wine producers um, that choose to use the word reserve in it and they use it for the, the wine that they make a million cases of per year. So for most of the world, reserve doesn't mean anything specific. Um, even in France, it doesn't mean anything specific. Um, it's very region specific. So in Italy, depending on the region and the grape um, and, um, and, and, and what label they're putting on it, reserve means a very different thing. Throughout all of Spain, Reserve or reserva, as they would say there, will always mean that it's been aged in oak. It's just the requirements for how long it's been aged in oak and in the bottle before it's released change based on the region. So Rioja has the highest standards or the most strict standards um, for oak aging. And so these are the four kind of categories. So for one, you'll see cosecha. So if everyone pulls up their first bottle of red wine, the blueberry, You'll see means harvest, um, so that is the year that it was harvested in. But whenever a wine is labeled cosecha, it means that it was basically bottled immediately and bottled the same year that it was harvested in. So you're going to harvest it in 2019. You're going to finish the harvest in September, October, whatever, and it's going to go into bottle before the end of that year or usually within six months. Um, so there's no oak aging on it. You can also see these wines labeled as joven, J-O-V-E-N, Joven, um, remember Spanish, the J is like an H. So joven just means young. Also means no oak aging, bottled almost immediately. Um, some, I mean, usually it's, it's a few months that the wine kind of hangs out and settles before they release it, but bottled very, very quickly and released very quickly. It's meant to be drunk young as well. The next label up would be Crianza. For the rest of Spain, it's just a year total. For Crianza in, um, in Rioja, specifically, you have to age the wine for a minimum of two years, one year of which has to be in barrel. So you could age it for three months, you could age it for, for releasing. Minimum requirement is two years. One of those years has to be in barrel before it's released. That doesn't mean it's new oak necessarily. It could be French or American. So they don't specify those things just the overall aging requirements. So if you're gonna use the word Crianza, those are the requirements you have to make. So if you like this style with a little bit of oak, but not over the top, then look for Crianza wines when you're shopping uh, in a wine store um, or when you're picking wine off a wine shelf. Um, so Reserva is one step up from that. So that's three years minimum of aging total. Again, one of which has to be in barrel. So you can do two in barrel, and one in the bottle before release, or you can do a year and a half in barrel, but has to be aged for three total years, one of which minimum has to be in barrel before it's released to the market or sold. And finally, Grand Reserva has the most oak aging on it possible. So five total years before it's released, two of which have to be in barrel. Those are the minimum requirements. Depending on the producer, you can see people well over, over, um, over, exceed those minimum requirements, depending on the kind of wine that they're trying to make. Often um, the very traditional uh, negociant, uh, ne sorry, the very traditional negociant wine houses like Marquez de Morieta, um, La Rioja Alta, Marquez de Caceres, uh, Muga, will use those colors, green, red, maroon, or like this purple color and blue to also signify which one it is. So they usually go hand in hand for those very traditional houses. Now notice, while well, y'all are sipping on that, this bottle of Finca Lally, nowhere on it says Gran Reserva. Um, however, this one was aged for six years and two of which, I think just over two of which was in oak. So technically it could be considered a Gran Reserva, 100% it meets all the requirements. But this producer is trying to stand outside of the traditional way Rio has were made, negociant style, and they're focusing on single vineyard wines. So that is why some producers choose not to label their wines as Cosecha, Crianza, Reserva, or Gran Reserva. They might label their wines differently and not even use the color coding or anything like that because their focus is not on 
fitting within the Rioja style in this box that um, these big negociants have, have kind of cultivated over, over centuries, but instead trying to do something different within the framework of the Rioja boundaries, within the framework of the traditional grapes, but focusing on site specificity instead of this oak, um, oak aging um, style and this oxidative style. So that's kind of a breakdown of why you do see those words sometimes, what they mean and um, why you don't always see them. Um, all right, let's taste. I mean, all right, I'll taste. Y'all have already been tasting. What are we getting in this wine? Um, I like these little emojis. How do we do those? I never get into the chat room to type, so um, now I'm curious. So, um, all right, let's see here. Um, upon opening, so Marianne, you're drinking uh, this Crianza here. A bit smoky, good tan. It's great. Definitely softens up after opening a little bit. Um, uh, holding out for some grilled tenderloins tomorrow. Absolutely. Um, good call on that one, too. There is a smoke. It's almost like that barnyardy funk but it's like dried out manure and, and you're, and it's got in the campfire a little bit. It's like smoky manure. Um, if that makes any sense. So Tawana says, I grew up in the oil fields in Texas. Smells like that lingering smell that sticks to dad when he comes home from work. Okay. Some, some real funk there. So I like that, um, emoji there. I think that's what it's doing. So smell all the funk. Yes. Grassy petroleum mix in my humble opinion. Um, took me a while. Um, before I figured out what that um, that meant, um, not grassy, um, farmish petroleum. Okay, cool. Um, Got barbecue ribs. Yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. Hector gets some smoke and leather with peppercorn. Yeah. So leather, tobacco, spice, all these plums and um, and black cherries and currants um, come out. That's across the board. Tempranillo kicks along with a lot of. Black pepper, chocolate, all of those baking spices that we talked about. Um, but a lot of dark fruit and red fruits kind of goes in between, depending on the style, with a lot of that leather, woodsy tobacco, pipe tobacco or cigar box kind of all goes in there. Um, sometimes some campfire and smoke. So y'all are nailing it um, with this. And yeah, all that funk, that's, that's Britannomyces. So that is that fungus that grows in the cellars that affects the smell of the wine. I think this is this is definitely muted. It's not over the top like some wines we've had in classes before where it's just like, whoo, that's a barnyard. Um, it's definitely a little bit more muted than that, but it's definitely there. Um, see the leather and smoke, um, a lot of ribs, and this isn't coming through for me. Um, maybe some campfire smoke. Okay, cool, talk about that, awesome. Um, this, oh, so you're not you're saying that barbecue smoky sauce. All right, cool, I like that. Um, cause barbecue sauce has that tang to it on top of that black pepper and that smoke, that combination of all of those. I can, I can see, I can see that for sure. Um, and yeah, uh, great question. So Tawana says, does nostalgia ever affect the, the way that you interpret or perceive those aromatics? 100%. In fact, out of all the senses, um, sight, I, I said sight and I'm bringing to my ears, um, hearing, sight, touch, smell, taste, out of all of our senses, the, the sense of smell is closest, um, the part of our brain that recognizes smell is right next to the part of our brain that stores memories. So out of all of our senses, nothing has the power to bring up a memory with as much power and, 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 and intensity as smell does. So um, I have literally walked by someone in the grocery store and they were wearing a cologne. I was like, that's my ex-boyfriend. Um, it wasn't them, but like the smell was that intense and it just brought up like very intense uh, memories. So, um, so definitely 100% um, nostalgia and our memories and, and our thoughts and, and our emotions are all, I guess, more uh, specifically affected by our sense of smell more than anything else, more than taste, more than sound even. Like you think of, oh, you hear a song, you're like, oh, that brings back so many memories. Even more so than that, uh, smell will activate that part of your brain that starts releasing memories. Um, so really, really interesting. Great, great question there. Um, um, I think it's blocking my ability to pick up other things. Yeah, sometimes 
I'm gonna give you all some little like smelling techniques then. Sometimes I do get stuck on one note in a wine and I can't get my brain to get past that to delve deeper in it. So there's different ways that I'll smell a wine to kind of do that. So one would be this very just like long, slow inhale. And you kind of like try and inhale just a small amount for a long period of time. And I start to notice picking up different things at different points of the inhale. So if I'm kind of stuck and I'm always getting this, Doing a longer, slower inhale will kind of hopefully help me get over that one smell that I can't get past. So you can try that. So for me, I got these like floral, dried floral and woodsy notes the longer I smelled it um, versus at the beginning was kind of all that other funk stuff. So you can try that. You can also try um, giving it a good swirl and blowing into the glass like a big puff of air. So all those aromatics that are being released when we swirl the wine sometimes get just stuck in our glass. So it's hard to get them past that and other things to open up. So give it a good swirl and then good swirl. Ooh, yeah, um, sometimes it splashes back up at you if you uh, do that too much. Um, thank you. So just another... Um, just another wine class with Kira spilling wine all over her face. So, so try that a couple of times. Oh man, I'm just, uh, now all of these red flowers, um, like geraniums and rose petals are kind of coming out. Um, dried flowers, not fresh. Um, so to me, the more I swirl the wine, the more of that is coming out after I get past those other aromatics. So, um, whew, but yeah, there's uh, some alcohol in this wine, right? I'm getting kind of a little bit of a, I have barely had any wine so far in this class and I'm getting a little bit of a head buzz. Yeah, we're at 14 and a half percent off pop. So that will, uh, that will make a difference. Wood pine with the blow test. I like that. So that's what I'll have to start calling that test. Um, wood pine. Yes. It's, um, almost like. Yeah, like the sap actually from a tree instead of just the wood itself. So, and total, so many plums on this specifically. I'm, I'm used to getting so much like cherry dominant wines um, or current cassis dominated wines, but one of my favorite things to pick up on wine is plums. I'm getting both like red and black plums on this. That pitted fruit. Um, stone fruit but in like the red and black category instead of peaches and apricots um really really delightful wine so far on the nose let me taste it mm, wow those tannins so that is what oak does to tempranillo Tempranillo can can stand up to it though and this is just a crianza so this just bends this particular one it's only 12 months in oak. It just says oak. I have a feeling they probably use different types of oak, and it's usually older oak, so it's not going to impart necessarily a lot of flavor, but more of those grip, those tannins, that textural component. Um, but now that um, now that Rio has changed so much in the last 40 years, well, well, what made it unique was its classic use of American oak. There's definitely now you see just as much French oak as you do American oak, and it's just very much dependent on what the winemaker wants to do with that wine. So also Slovenian, uh, Hungarian oak, um, sometimes um, uh, cement fats, sometimes um, um, uh, amphora or um, terracotta pots, basically. So a lot more differences and diversity in how the wine is aged, not just American oak, um, like what was traditional. So. All right, so what do y'all think of this one as our as our Crianza entry into the oak? And what did you think of this wine? Yeah, absolutely. I will send you the list of wines for sure. Um, So Sampat says, I didn't like it at first, but it's definitely getting better as it breathes. Yes. And Tempranillo especially will do that. It likes oak and it likes oxygen. So um, um, especially this isn't made in an oxidative style. So even though it was aged in oak, you can tell from the coloring that it doesn't have intense oxygen on the wine because it's still that ruby red with hints of like the blue undertones, so a little bit of purple flecks in there. 
Um, none of those golden notes. So um, even though it was ancient oak, they didn't do the um, intentional oxidation during that oak aging process. So Tawana says, I like it. It's bold without being aggressive. I do think it needs some food for sure. Yeah. Um, it's rare to find some Tempranillos that are oaky that don't need food, but it doesn't always have to be a lot of food or heavy food. So while lamb um, is like the dish, um, you also do a lot of pork there. Um, but this is where sheep's milk uh, manchego cheese is so popular. So manchego cheese, you can find it at any grocery store, even if it's just like the six month age, you don't have to get the really fancy stuff. Get some manchego cheese, get some Spanish olives, like really get Spanish olives because the herbs are a little bit different than Italian olives. And just some, um, you could do some Spanish almonds um, and some pretzels. And that's like the best meal you'll have. Um, it's, um, one of the things I fell in love with was, uh, oh, and dates too. If you like, if you like a little bit of sweetness too with that mix, just use some dates with that manchego cheese. Um, and it's a beautiful thing and see how the wine comes together. So, um, favorite cheese. Yes. I love manchego, um, for sure. So, um, it has a little bit more flavor than a lot of cow's milk cheeses in that style. It's softer than Parmesan. Um, and it's not as sharp. Um, so it's a little bit just easier to just kind of snack on and eat the whole wedge by yourself. Not that I do that every day, but many days. Um, all right. So I would love to spend a little bit more time on the last wine because it is just so interesting. Even if you hate this wine, um, cause it's very polarizing. It's very different wine. Um, it's at least the most conversation starting wine that you might have had in a while. So whenever you're ready, no rush, but whenever you're ready, you can finish up your Crianza by Ostatu, and um, we'll get into the Finca Lali by um, Boleas Bilar. Um, Marian, since um, um, you love Ostatu so much and love the rosé, how did you like the white and the Crianza that you had um had from them was it um was it a, a good thing for you you're such a spanish wine lover um and i i would love to do another class on parish balta by the way and when i do i'll let you know for sure um so um Bernalyn says i can definitely drink this all by itself i love it yeah so isn't it so funny how based on our different styles and preferences a wine could be only with food for someone and oh definitely by itself for other people it's kind of like i drank coffee like some people, um, just straight up espresso, super hot, very bitter. They don't even put sugar or cream or a lemon or anything on it. They'll just drink it like that all day. Totally fine. Um, some people, they only drink coffee if it's in like a Frappuccino style. So some people don't like coffee at all. So um, it all depends on just your taste and how much bitterness, how much tannins, how much sweetness, how much acid that you're used to, comfortable with, and enjoy. Um, so don't think that if um, if you thought it was only with food and someone else said by itself, then something's different about your wine or anything like that. We all just have different palates, and that's a thing to celebrate, not um, try and ignore or distract. So um, I love that about these wine classes. There's so many different opinions. We're all trying the same wine, and, and it doesn't mean that anyone had a had a, a bad palate or anything like that. So awesome. All right. Well... Those first three were delicious. Now on to this. Now, if you've been decanting this, I will warn you, there is so much sediment in this wine. So don't pour the last ounce or so unless you just want to get that kind of a mouthful of grit. Um, all right. This is when I really wish I could see everybody. I know everyone has like Zoom fatigue and stuff like that, but I love reading the room and watching everybody's facial expressions when they get to get that first whiff of that, um, that new wine. Oh my gosh. Now I had to do a very quick decant on this because I got back from deliveries, got to my parents' house around um, 5.30. So I, didn't, I wasn't able to decant it as long as I was recommending everybody else decant it but I just put it in the decanter and then I was just like shaking it up, not even like a gentle swirl, but I'm like just trying to get as much air into the wine as possible. 
So you don't always have to be really elegant with your treatment of wine. You can even do what they call it producer in Australia. In Australia, they only have uh, screw caps. They don't actually use corks at all. Um, I think there are a couple producers that do. You have to pay a big fee for every cork that you use. It's just trying to be as environmentally sustainable as possible. So in order to do basically an inelegant uh, decant on your wine and get air infused into the wine as quickly as possible, they will, they, they created this thing, just turned it, coined it, the Molly Duker shake. They'll open the wine, they'll pour out, you know, a glass or so just to allow for a little bit more room in it. They'll put the top back on, which is a screw cap, so it is easier because it's not so easy with a, a cork. But you can do this. Just put a napkin over it because you will get some drips. And then you just take it and you just shake it. And shaking it is going to make all that air, just that little bit of air right here, quickly infuse into the rest of the wine. So if you are ever in need to quickly get some air into your wine, you can do that, but you have to pour a little bit out first. Um, so there's that room for that oxygen to kind of get through. So, all right, everybody have this wine. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> all right, I'm reading the room by just watching my parents' expressions. Um, There are some eyebrows raised over at this side on the table on, in Suffolk. Um, yes, wow, that is unique, right? So don't even start thinking, do I like it or not yet? Just allow yourself the time to smell this wine and try and limit the things that you're smelling to just 50 because it'll be hard, I think, with this wine. There's so much going on that keeping it to just 50 adjectives is going to be difficult. So um, intense in a good way. Okay. I was hoping that y'all would like this. This was, um, um, yeah. Um, all right. I'm not even going to give you my tasting notes yet or what I'm getting. I'm going to let everyone just hang out with this wine a little bit. So to talk about this producer, um, this producer is Bodegas Bilar. They have their just the regular like Crianza, Reserva, and Gran Reserva wines, or I don't even know if they do a Gran Reserva wines, but they have their entry tier wines, which are delicious. Um, then they have their single vineyard wines or their finca labels. So finca um, is farm in Spanish. And so they have finca blank, finca blank, finca blank. So you'll see a bunch of this, but they're all different uh, vineyards. So this is the Lali vineyard. This vineyard was planted in 1910, so these vines are 110 years old and still going strong. Um, and it's a 2012 vintage. So um, it also has 15% of Viura blended in and not, and I believe it's co-fermented from what I can tell from their website. Um, that means that they are, they are using white and red grapes and co-fermenting them together. And what Viura does as a white grape, um, is similar to what Viognier does when it's co-fermented with Syrah. Um, that is very, really popular in the Northern Rhone Valley of France uh, and also in Australia and some other places that follow those traditional techniques. And the white grape, because of the acids and enzymes in that specific white grape, literally pulls out more color and flavor and tannins from the red grape skin. So you think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna co-ferment white wine and red wine together, that means that the red wine is going to be lighter. It's going to be softer. Well, that often happens if you just add white wine to it, blended afterwards, like the blueberry here. Um, but if you're going to co-ferment them, that means they're all fermenting at the same time, being crushed together, being, um, being fermented together. Then those enzymes in the white grapes actually break down the skins of the red grapes even more. So you get deeper concentration. Like this is very, very extracted, concentrated wine. You get deeper aromatics too. <laughs> and we can all smell how that is for real. Um, and you get those more tannins and flavors pulled out more from the red grape skins because of what the white grape enzymes do during the fermentation process. So really fascinating. They're also a biodynamic producer. Um, I won't get too much into biodynamics because we can go away on a rabbit trail with that one. I do have a YouTube video, like episode three or four or something like that. And um, it's just about biodynamics. So check that out if you are looking for more information on that. But it's basically a whole philosophy that not just organic practicing, 
but creating a very holistically healthy and head waves across the world as more and more people recognize this practice as not just for the hippies, but for people who want to make the best wine possible and maintain the healthiest vines possible. So without further ado, anyone need some coffee? Because there's so much coffee flavors and like toasted coffee beans, espresso notes and mocha notes in this wine that like, like I could get for the morning with my breakfast and get away with it because there's so many coffee notes. So, all right. Steve Hill, Sun Pop says, first impression, there are many dusty leather shoes. Oh, these are my dusty leather shoes that I haven't worn for a year and forgot that I had put some figs and plums from last summer in them before putting them on the shelf. And then do you put your feet in there and crush them all up together and get like the, yes, okay, I love it, I love it. And then Trina put cloves in them to make them all smell better. Yes, I think that that is the, Best wine description you have ever given, Papa. Um, for real, that is that is to a T perfect. All the dustiness, all the leatherness, that dried, raisinated kind of old funky fruit, um, and then some spicy cloves. And um, yeah, could not be could not have said it better myself. Um, I get the clove too with vanilla. Yes, like vanilla bean, like Madagascar vanilla bean. If you've ever just like smelled the whole beans, that pungentness. So <laughs> Dewan says, I'm dying. Yes, um, that, is, um, that is quite the creative note. Um, Anna says, this opened up so nicely. Definitely snuck a small, small taste right when I opened it. Yes, always do that. When you open the wine, because if it's corked, you don't want to spend the next three hours of your life decanting and treating this wine, looking forward to it in great anticipation just to find out that the wine's bad. So Always, before I decant, I will taste the wine. Um, first of all, so I can see the progression of flavor as it opens up. And second, just to make sure I don't waste all that time. So very, very smart. Um, gonna be a late night breaking down this complex wine, right? This is why I wanted to give so much time at the end of the class um, just to talk about this wine. Smells like dried fruitcake, yes. Um, with all of those like uh, spice notes to it too. Um, I've never been a fan of fruitcake, but I did always love the smell of it, especially um, it was like um, nutmeg, straight up nutmeg. Um, like when you first grind nutmeg, like on top of eggnog, it makes me think of Christmas, I think. Um, there's so much um, on this. So um, uh, fruitcake, more relatable than the smell issues. Yes, because um, I don't know how many times anyone has ever had that specific experience with their shoes, but... Um, does anyone get the eucalyptus in here too? So I was talking about the coffee notes, the espresso, mocha, like that side of things. Um, so I get these like dense, dark, deep, rich things. But then I also get this like pop of eucalyptus. Um, you think about your friends that smoke menthol cigarettes, that kind of like mentholated pop um, or juniper, you know, think about how your gin um, smells. All of those like bright green herbal that, um, that almost are like alcoholic in the way that they kind of like burst into your sinuses, the smell of those things. Uh, menthol, eucalyptus, juniper, all of those are very similar on the spectrum for me at least how I experienced them. Was getting menthol, yes. Um, I get that a lot in this wine. I think I'm getting it less the more and more I swirl it. But the first sip, it was like almost the only thing. It smells like mint chocolate chip ice cream kind of thing. Um, mint chocolate chip coffee ice cream on top of the shoes that my dad <laughs> left in his closet for a year. <laughs> All right, so those of you who are drinking this, um, what could you imagine this being served with? Um, this is to me definitely not a summer wine, but I couldn't wait any longer to feature it. Um, I literally created I, I've created like different ideas for different wine dinners and just thinking about excuses where I can open this up with more people because it's so interesting. Um, so what would you drink it with? Probably not the same dishes as you would drink the other three wines with, right? Definitely nothing spicy. All of the intensity and the spiciness and the acidity of this wine will um, Accentuate the flavors of spice, and that's all you will taste by itself. Okay, awesome. You have some manchego cheese. What is this? Is this? 
That's the yellow spur. No, it's not. Oh, oh, that's the um, mm. Bella Vitana. Delicious. Okay. Let's see. Trying to some classic Bella Vitana. Really delicious Italian cheese. Um, mm. No, the wine less interesting, actually. Um, that um, I'm going to try it with some just Colby um, Jack cheese, just like some cheddar. See if a more mild cheese would actually keep the intrigue level of the, um, the wine. Mm. Much better. Still, it kind of distracts from the wine. Um, that's interesting. Twana, I love that. Smoked brisket. Yes. I want this with meat. I don't even want this with cheese. The other wines are really with cheese. This wine I want with braised meat, stewed meat. I want roast. I want, even if you're going to do summer fair version of that, so think of like a lamb gyro. Um, um, something along the meat side of things. Um, um, <laughs> yes, definitely careful not to over season the brisket. You wouldn't want anything to kind of, while this is intense on the flavor, there's also some delicacy of it. Um, it's not, um, the aromatics are intense, but the actual structure of the wine is still, is still delicate. It's not just like pound you in the face, um, tannins and such. So licorice. Awesome. When you take a sip and I smell licorice, um, I like that. I think, um, on the licorice side, I'm almost going for more of the like herbal side of licorice. You think of like raw fennel and how that smells, or Thai basil and how that smells on that greener style of licorice. But totally, totally get that. Um, yeah. So Steve Hill says, "I get the lit eucalyptus. I wouldn't figure it out until you would have said it." That's what's so fun about tasting wine with other people. Some of that is confirmation bias. Like I say something, and then you're gonna get it, but. You are all experienced enough tasters now at this point to challenge me and disagree with me if you if you don't actually get it. But when you are tasting with people, they might pick up on something that you didn't, and then that will open up your mind to a different aspect of the wine that you wouldn't pick up on your own. And that that's not that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So um, awesome spaghetti bolognese with beef stew poutine. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, absolutely. Be careful, everyone. When you talk about these recipes, I know where you all live since I delivered wine to you. So I'm just going to show up one time and be like, where's the food? Um, Hector and I are getting a lot of tobacco. Yeah, I get a lot of like, um, I imagine this is the tobacco Clint Eastwood smokes. Like a very rustic cowboy, but who can look at you with those piercingly romantic eyes, you know, like that um, that kind of style of tobacco, if that's a thing, a personality. Um, <sighs> um, loads of tobacco on there. Man, there's just so much. I think we still are a little bit shy of 50 adjectives, though, even if we combine all our notes together. So you can keep it going if you uh, continue to experience other things in this one. Cool. So after you taste it, if you focus on the acid level, how much your mouth is watering, the acid level is very high in this wine, right? This is this is a wine that has structure and acidity. So you can very easily age this wine for another decade, no problem whatsoever. So don't be afraid thinking like, oh, it's eight years old. It probably needs to be drunk right away. We decanted this wine for four hours. Um, it is still acidic and structured and kind of like, um, there's so much tension going on with this wine. Very easily aged for another 10 years. So, um, don't be scared to age this wine. Um, um, <laughs> well, you know, yes, he's not necessarily romantic, but there is that, I don't know, maybe, maybe romantic isn't the right word. Almost like seductive, just like that piercing quality of like, Masculinity. Um, maybe <laughs> yeah, maybe mental Marlboro man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know what I'm going for though. Um, Desperado. There we go. Um, all right. So, was anyone coming into this class not a Tempranillo 
that became a Tempranillo? Or did you come into this class loving Tempranillo and they're like, none of the wines you served me were anything like the Tempranillos I've ever had before. Um, how has this class opened up um, our ideas of what Rioja is, what Spanish wines can be, and what Tempranillo is too? James Bond. All right, yeah, okay. Hypermasculinity, but in a seductive way. Um, yes, I think, um, I think that's very much um, what I like about this wine, yeah. Or like the Dos Equis man, the most interesting man in the room, you know, smoking jacket, um, but in like this plush, plush, uh, um, Sean Connery James Bond is basically what I'm thinking of. Yeah, okay. So I spit out all the other wines, but um, this wine is, is um, too darn good, so. To be fair, I mixed up the classes and thought this was a limestone, so a huge surprise. Okay, yes. Um, yes, this, uh, well, actually, this kind of, they go in hand in hand because there is limestone soils in here. So I was really trying to figure out whether or not this wine was going to be a limestone wine, class wine, or a Rioja class wine. Maybe both, <laughs> maybe I'll just put it in next week's class too, just because I want to taste it again. Um, but yes, it is. Um, all of these are grown in limestone soils, um, but not technically the limestone class. We'll do a lot more white wines with the limestone class ne uh, next week. So uh, all fabulous. Awesome. Um, um, blind tasting taught me that you can never be sure of a Tempranillo. That is the truth. Um, as a psalm, um we have to blind taste a lot. And during the blind tasting kind of training, when you're preparing for this exam, we're going to have to blind taste and get scored on it. Um, to much more, you can see all three of these wines were Tempranillo. All three of these were from a classic region that focuses on Tempranillo. There is so much difference um, in Tempranillo. It is, it is kind of like mushrooms or tofu in terms of it takes on the flavor of whatever it's cooked with. So Tempranillo can vary so drastically based on what the winemaker wants to express through their Tempranillo. So very difficult to blind taste Tempranillo. Um, I, that's why the classic style of Rioja was easy to pin down, but not necessarily Tempranillo and all of its different other styles. So first tasted te Tempranillo in San Diego. And because they were a little harder to find, I didn't realize that they were so varied in Tokyo's classes. Yes. I'm sorry. I, um, I feel like, what I always do in my classes is I take something that is just break it all down. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's impossible to understand. And let me show you why. Um, but that's kind of why I like wine is because it's not as simple. Um, and, and there's, it doesn't necessarily fit in the box that we want it to. Um, so it is always going to keep us on our toes. It's always going to keep us guessing. It's always going to just keep making us fall in love with it over and over again. So I think that's why I like, why? One of one of the ten thousand reasons. So, um, like I did with calculus, what? Make, make it impossible to understand. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely not good with math at all, um, and definitely not calculus for sure. Um, whew, yeah, no way. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm not apologizing, but I'm. I I do understand that that. There is a lot of books out there, a lot of classes out there, a lot of wine bloggers, a lot of wine uh, professionals out there who do the opposite of what I do. They take something complicated and they're really good at, at making it simple. And I take that and be like, no, that, that doesn't allow us to fully experience all of the breadth and, uh, of the wine. So I do um, generally always make things harder for myself and for everyone else around me. So um, definitely... I'm not apologizing because I think that's the best way to appreciate wine is to, is, uh, to appreciate its complexity. Um, but I do understand that that makes it harder sometimes. So thank y'all for um, sticking with me. So um, class taught us more to love for Spanish wine. Awesome. Super happy. So maybe we'll change the theme of the class. Maybe that'll be another possible theme from um, uh, Loire Valley Wines to Pacific Valley, Pacific, um, Pacific, coast uh reds to um somewhere in between we might do some spanish wines too so um who knows um um <laughs> i like it tomorrow says i definitely prefer what you do because this way i'm never wrong it's true i rarely say uh anyone is ever wrong uh, for their tasting notes or what they think about the wine so someone wants to have a party just around this wine yeah i like that 
uh, for good discussions, good conversation um, to be had about this wine for sure. So, um, Bernalyn, I just now taste the tobacco ness. I love it. Interesting how much it tastes evolves after mm -hmm. it aerates or as it opens up. And yeah, y'all are y'all are drinking the one that was decanted four hours ago. So I highly recommend maybe not even finishing this wine tonight um, and put a cork back in it. Drink the rest of the wines tonight. Try this wine again tomorrow and just be blown away again by how much it will develop over the next 24 hours. Um, should we put it in the refrigerator? And um, mom says, should we put it in the refrigerator? I like aging, um, not aging. I like putting wine, red wine that I've opened in the refrigerator, not to serve it cold, but it will preserve it longer. But in this wine's case, we don't actually want to preserve it as it is. We want to see how it will continue to evolve over the next 24 hours. So just leave it in your wine fridge or right on your shelf or somewhere, hopefully like not right by the stove. You don't want it to get above like 75 degrees, um, but um, right over the AC vent or something like that will be perfect. Um, and let me know if you do that. Um, I'd love a text tomorrow um, or an email or shout out on Facebook of how this wine continued to evolve over the next 24 hours and how it might taste differently, totally different tomorrow because you didn't try three wines in advance of this wine. So, um, um, like that you expand my taste beyond what I would normally drink. Yes, thank you. I um, Life is too short to drink the same wine over and over again, except if it's this wine, because I kind of want to with this one. Um, check first thing in the morning. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, or I like tasting wine first thing in the morning. I don't have the stresses of the day. I know y'all think I'm crazy. I promise I don't just like drink all day, but I line up my tastings with distributors, usually at, like nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm spitting, um, but it allows me to kind of taste with a fresher palate, as long as I haven't had too much coffee just right before, um, and without the stresses of the day and the, the complexities and all of this stuff, and and you, and you and wine tastes totally different when you taste under those circumstances. So, um, um, yeah, I know it was kind of a joke what you were saying, Papa, but no, I fully, fully recommend tasting this wine first thing in the morning. So. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in to this nerdy class on Rioja and for sticking with me throughout all of the, especially the beginning part of the history and the science and all of this stuff. So I love being nerdy with you all. I love sharing wine with you all. Hopefully we can do it again in real life. Um, I'm just now starting to open up to private tastings in people's homes for small groups of people, people maximum. Um, I'm happy to work with you to set up something and taste wines that you love with people that you love in real life. So um, you all have my information. Let me know if you're interested in that. Look forward to seeing you next week for the limestone class. We'll be doing two whites and two reds for that um, from four different pockets of the world. So very excited. Can't wait to talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe and sane and what's the other three things that I say? Stay safe, sane, and healthy. Maybe maybe I should just focus on the sane part. So <laughs> all right. Bye guys. And, and.